I love telling the story of how I met the people I'm interviewing because oftentimes there is a personal connection that happens way before the interview, and that is very, very true with Matt's case. Matt and I connected on YouTube months and months and months ago, and in fact, for his language card games that he's going to talk about during this interview, because he should, because it's awesome, I actually did a review for the cards a few months ago that's still on my YouTube channel. And he's come out with a few new decks for the cards since then, and as a matter of fact, he's so hardworking, and they are such a really, a really amazing tool to learn Chinese well playing a game. We met on YouTube. I had got a glimpse into his level of the of, of Mandarin Chinese and I, I was awestruck. I am still, even now, a year and a half in, still struggling with getting basic things out of my mouth that are not just grammatically correct, but that actually get something done, that convey some sort of meaning. And so I was just, I was awestruck that he was so advanced that not only was he using the language functionally, but he was creating specific gaming world vocabulary games to help other people get to a, a very high level in a very fun way. And so I knew when I started the Tandine Scripts podcast that he was going to be on here. I think you're going to really, really enjoy Matt's insight and experience into learning and using and using Mandarin Chinese in China. One final audio note to make here. This interview with Matt was done a couple of months ago. This was meant to be the first episode of this season of Changing Scripts. Long story short, it was my first remote interview and I made every single mistake with the technical slash audio aspect of it. And I couldn't do it by myself. And I finally reached out to Jave Jackson at the school of podcasting.com. And we finally got the audio to the point where it is listenable. I appreciate your patience with those tiny residual audio things that might come through. So thank you very much, Dave. Thank you so much for remotely being in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. My name is Matthew Boyle and I grew up outside of Washington, DC. I can trace back my interest to China and Chinese to a single moment in high school when I picked up a small book of Zen parables. My father received a miniature Zen garden from a friend to keep on his desk at work, and it came with this book. So I read these parables, and I got really interested in Zen and Buddhism and later Taoism. And I was reading a lot of that in high school, and when I went to university, I kept studying that kind of stuff. And I took uh, a year of Chinese, and then I was planning to teach in my home state, Virginia. But when I was graduating and getting ready to start teaching there, a friend suggested, why don't you come to China? You can do the same thing over here. You know, you can teach over here for a couple of years. There's no need for you to settle down sit right away. <laughs> and, you know, I was thinking in a similar way. I've never really gotten out before. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, why don't I try that? And I, I did right after graduation, came to China, Guilin, Guangxi province. And I've been here ever since, really enjoying it. But for our listeners that aren't that familiar with China, can you kind of describe where that is? Oh, sure. Guangxi is in the south. And Guilin is a very popular tourist hotspot. It's uh, maybe an hour and a half from a place called Yangshu. Mm hmm where uh, a lot of backpackers and hikers and travelers and tourists go. They have that famous karst photography, those mountains that are very finger-like. Right. And they, they do the bamboo rafts down the river. It's actually, Yangshu is on the back of the $20 Chinese bill. Oh. Uh, or the 20, the 20 yuan bill. So you can see a picture of that area. It's very scenic. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful place to go. I lived there for two years. The weather gets pretty hot, humid, a little bit unpredictable. But I actually hope maybe in the future I could move back there if I do settle down in China. I think that would be a great place to do it. That was from 2011 to 2013. I oh, first okay. came in 2011. Okay. Yeah. Where do you live in China now? Are you in China? Right now I live about two hours north of Guangzhou. Okay in Guangdong province, kind of in the countryside boonies. Did you did up. you start learning Chinese in high school when you start, first started being attracted to the, the Zen? I learned Chinese for the first time in university. I took it for one year. Oh, okay, okay. It was actually kind of 
it was kind of by chance that it came about because I, you know, I went to university and I actually studied Arabic for a year oh. and I really enjoyed it. And then something happened with the language requirement. They kind of messed me up and they said, you basically have a choice. You can redo the Arabic class again. You know, something with my credits was messed up. They said, you can do that again, or you can choose a new language. And I said, well, I really loved Arabic, but I'm not going to sit through the same class for another year just to confirm my credit. So I chose Chinese at that point. So it was kind of a little bit by chance, although I was very interested in Chinese culture. I didn't expect I would be leaving the U.S. So I just wanted, I just chose anything I wanted, basically. I wasn't thinking I would ever go to China. Uh, I was kind of a false, what do they call it? A false beginner, a false starter. Right. When I came to China, it was several years after I had taken that class. So I basically had to relearn the basics again. Yep. I'd like to ask you some questions about your first language. Is English your first language? Yes, it is. Okay. Do you remember anything either in the classroom or at home or anywhere? Do you remember anything about the process or the language that kind of sticks out in your memories of your childhood? Absolutely. I always share this kind of story with my students that growing up, uh, it was very important and it was a ritual at home that my parents would read to me every night. Mm -hmm. So that probably began when I was in the womb. Let's say, I think my mom was probably reading stories to me then. <laughs> <laughs> that, I think, was critical for me because it gave me a strong interest and a strong ability in vocabulary from a young age. And we had all these books in the bedroom. And, you know, after dinner, I had to go to bed. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to stay up and watch a lot of TV or anything. So I, they, they would say, after dinner, take your shower, go to your bedroom, look at some books, wait for us. And my mom and dad would take turns every day and, and read me a story every single night. And as, and, you know, as I got a little bit older and more able, mm -hmm. I would read to them and later to my younger brothers and sisters. So I really think that's critical to be reading stories with young ones. Right. Okay, the image of you reading to your parents is adorable. Oh, that, is, that is so cute. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know, if, if it was if it was a very hard book, then we might, you know, we might do like I read a page, they read a page, I read a page, they read a page. Because I would insist that I want to read some. You know, so, sometimes you want to be read to, but sometimes as a child, you you want to be the boss and you want to read the book. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Wow. Okay, stepping into the classroom of your childhood, do you remember any positive or challenging experience on learning any aspect of the language? It can be K through 12, anywhere in there. Going off to school was a little bit hard for me. I was kind of introverted and I wasn't really, um, I, I wasn't that great at making friends uh, in elementary school. You know, I might have had one or two in every class. I was kind of introverted, kind of shy. And I can remember I didn't want to go to school, really. I had trouble with that. I used to like to do cartooning, kind of journal, write stories, write poetry. And I had a lot of teachers who did a lot of creative writing and exercises with us. And I think I always did pretty darn well in the English classes. So I, I never really had a problem there. My, Like I said, my teachers were very creative. We had to do a variety of uh, writing exercises and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I can't remember anything outstanding. You know, writing and reading was always a big part of my life. And I used to cartoon and doodle a lot during school. And I'm sure I still have some notebooks saved somewhere. I can show I wasn't paying attention in math. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh. I remember as a kid, because I also grew up reading heaps, and I remember as a kid when we were going over, as some some children's stuff for the classroom is, the topics aren't necessarily super interesting. So I remember like putting my book up, sort of like it's um, it's standing on its, instead of it being flat on the table, kind of standing it up and making my own puppet shows with my hands while we were reading stuff aloud in class because I was so bored with the content. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, I'm bored. I'm going to fix, I'm going to make this better for me, you know? And of course we're like in a circle and everybody's reading their different parts and they get to me and I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm in the middle of a play over here. What are you doing? <laughs> mm. <laughs> 
once you have that experience of so many different things that exist in the written realm that you can read, I think it's hard to sometimes hard to. Oh read. yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. I definitely had a very powerful imagination. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, and when you come to school, what how how it often goes is you have to put aside what you're doing, thinking, or feeling to learn what's required of everybody to learn. So everyone has to conform to this pattern. Right. Right, right. And that's a problem I had later was um, kind of reclaiming this dream I had to run a card shop. I mean, you know what I'm doing now. That was something I was into when I was young. I used to draw comic books and and make games. And as I got older, maybe teenager, late teenager, I felt like I had to finally give that up, which is totally wrong, but it must happen to a lot of people. Oh, yeah, I think it does. I think it does. And on some level, it probably, I don't know if it needs to, I mean, to educate people in a group the size of most classrooms. I think it needs to happen, oh, but I'm not sure that yeah, that's how yeah, we need yeah. to be educated anymore. But that's a whole other, whole other bag right, of pounds. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, like some of my, I'm sure some of your students in China told you this too, but I've had students tell me that they've had up to like 60 and 80 students in one class for primary school. Oh yeah, I know, it's amazing. And I Crazy. just, I can't even, ma like when my when my language classrooms got above like 20 or 25 people, I'd be like, okay, this is really not doable anymore. So I'm like, how can, and those were teenagers to adults. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, having children like five, six, seven years old with 80 of them in one classroom, no wonder there has to be that a sense of conformity to move forward and learn stuff. Oh yeah, you can see the extreme of it here in China for sure. Definitely, yeah. definitely. A question I love to ask, because I, I am an avid reader, as it sounds like you are too, is um, in, in our formative years, a lot of people seem to fall on one side or the other of if they're more, of a, more drawn to reading or more drawn to writing. Did you have an affinity for one or the other, or were you pretty equally split? I think I was pretty equally split. Reading and writing were both very strongly encouraged by my parents, and they they got me a lot of books, and they also got me a lot of writing and drawing materials. And I can remember growing up, I just used to lay on the floor and draw and write. And I had this funny habit where I wouldn't breathe when I was doing it. So I would finish a, a sentence or finish a part of the picture and then have this huge sigh and breath. And my parents used to remind me, don't forget to breathe. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. Matt, Matthew's drawing. Matt, don't forget to breathe. Why, why do you think you started to do that? That's really interesting. Well, well, I would focus on the part so intensely that I would hold my breath because I didn't want to make a little mistake on my paper. And I would just lay on the floor and just have crayons or pencils all around me. Oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. That's really interesting. I'm trying to think of... I don't know. Wow, that's yeah. So I think kind of, kind of, those were pretty fairly split. I always like to do both of those things, and I still do. Mm -hmm. Let's come back to when you were learning Chinese. So you said you started learning Chinese when you were at university. So can you kind of describe the the classroom setting that that was? Sure. I was very lucky at university. I had several teachers from. I had I think three teachers from China and one from Korea, mm -hmm. and one whose parents were born in Japan, but he was born in the States. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of teachers from Asia, and the Chinese teacher I had was a man named Carl Zhang. Mm -hmm. He might still be there. Uh, <laughs> he was from Sichuan, mm -hmm. and he was an amazing man who could speak German, English, fluently, as well as Chinese. And he might have been able to speak one more language. And he used to also do Tai Chi classes and teach Tai Chi in the square of the school. Oh, wow. That class, I think we had about 20 students, and it was led by him. Mm -hmm. And then the next semester, I had a woman from China. I don't remember where she was from. And then a TA from China who took over for a few weeks. So that was the first year. But I, we had about 20 students. And they were the same, mostly the same people throughout the year. It was pretty typical language learning class. I mean, they would teach some content from the book, teach the vocabulary, how to pronounce it. And then they would ask us to rehearse the conversations printed in the books 
with the person sitting next to us. Did you feel like it was speaking heavy or did you feel like it was pretty uh, balanced between many of the skills? It was pretty speaking heavy in the class. We had a writing characters workbook that we were supposed to do basically for homework. So we would write characters at home and maybe do a little review of vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And in the class, I think we, we really only wrote in the class was very little, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, I'm guessing, per class. And we would somehow, when we had the tests, we would have to write down the vocabulary or short sentences. But I think we, we definitely talked mostly in the class. Right, right, right. And now, with any teachers, there are many factors that can make it difficult to manage a classroom. So I say the next question with the utmost respect for teachers in general and language teachers specifically. Was there anything that you wish they had done differently in the classroom? Well, you know, it's kind of hard to remember because we're talking about this. This is about <laughs> this is about 10 years ago. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I have a little trouble remembering exactly what I thought of that class. I, I, honestly, I, I remember loving it. I was head over heels for it and I, and I know I got an A. So I don't think I would have had any problems with the class. I loved my teachers, my classmates, and everything that happened. Fair enough. Um, if I could have said anything, I, w I probably would have said, forget the tests, but that's <laughs> hard oh, to do. Oh, right. <laughs> 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 and this is kind of digging back to that, that beginning time period, too. And we'll move on from that. But just do you have any memories of things coming from English into Chinese, any specific things that really were like the biggest struggles when you first switched languages? The biggest struggle? Yeah. Um, I'll give you a really silly example that I'm just starting to get okay. over now about a year in is um, the spacing issue. There aren't any spaces between words mm -hmm. in Chinese. Mm -hmm. And um, with the limited oh, yeah. vocabulary, I mean, I still, like I just passed HSK2, so I'm still very, very low level. But I still sometimes, if I don't know, I can know the words around it and kind of figure out, okay, this two or three character thing is either one or two words kind of thing, or maybe it could be three words. But generally speaking, the, the really short ones I know at this point. So I'm like, okay, it's probably one or two words. But at the beginning, I really, really struggled with just looking at a line with the period at the end going, I don't know how many words the sentence is. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Chinese doesn't have those spaces mm -hmm. like our language does. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, even even though I, I, I will admit my Chinese level is not very high, I didn't struggle very much because I loved it so much. I was fascinated with it. But the one thing I can remember that I felt a little bit intimidated by was the tone issue. Oh, yeah. I can remember that. And I used to say, when I was first learning it, I used to say, I can't remember the tones for the words. That's too much to remember. We have to remember a tone, second tone, third tone. We have to remember that for every word. That's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people told me, don't worry about that now. Just get going. Just get started. Don't you, you know you can you can emphasize that a little more later if you need to. But just you know, don't let that hold you back right now. So I just put that aside, and then I've just been in love with it ever since. I, I never, I still don't worry about tones. That's my really bad. I know that's maybe bad to say. Some people would think that's horrible that I don't. But <laughs> I've really heard. Two sides to it. One is that you have to get the tones right from the beginning. And then I've had some really fluent folks who learned it as, as an adult tell me, just do everything as third tone and just speak fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of different things, but people seem to fall on both sides. Like, because they change, because the tones change depending on what's around them sometimes, right? So uh, if, you, if you memorize it as one static creature, then you're pretty much going to mess it up later anyway. I, that's encouraging to hear because I'm, I'm not ignoring it because I'm trying to mimic what I'm hearing, but I'm definitely not trying to remember what they are. If I'm saying, if I'm reading yeah. it from a text, I'm, try, I'm not trying to get the tones definitely right. Here, here's actually a little tip I can give about that. Oh yeah. And it may work for people who are getting into a kind of leaving the beginner stage, going to the intermediate stage, people who chat with Chinese people on the streets is what you can try to do is when they speak mm -hmm. and you kind of understand what they're saying and what you're talking about, mm -hmm. you can re when you reflect back those words, mm -hmm. 
you can make sure you reflect back the same tone that they said. I mean, if you can identify the tone when they speak, then when you speak it back, you can make sure you nail it. Yeah. But otherwise, you don't really remember the tone per se, but in conversation, you make sure you get it once the word's been coming up. Right. Definitely. Definitely. And I, I, I don't have a lot of in-person conversations as of yet because my vocabulary is still very low, but I do find with short exchanges that that works a lot better. And for me, I just, I stop stressing out about the tone and I just think of how does it sound? What's the music coming out of their mouth kind of thing? And I try to just kind of rip. Oh yeah, 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 exactly. Because that is much more beautiful than a symbol or a number <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Yeah, no, that's a really good, really good thing. I have often wanted to take out my phone and record my super brief conversations and then practice with that person later, but that, I don't know, as of right now, that just feels weird. And I never know when, exactly when it's going to happen, so it's just like I need to be always ready with my recorder. <laughs> yes. But, well, that reminds me, one thing that I do is I like to visit the same people at the same shops and kind of build on our past conversations. Right. So if I find someone I really like that I think I could be friends with, I keep going to their dumpling shop or their balza shop. Because we've already developed that kind of rapport, we can try to go a little bit further the next time or talk about a slightly different topic the next time. Excellent tip. Excellent tip. And once they know that you're like, if you're at a somewhat beginning stage, once they know you're learning and you're trying, then I think they're much more likely to be exactly. flexible and to, to help you out a little bit by using easier language and that kind of thing. Like people are pretty, yes, yes. pretty forgiving about uh, mistakes in languages. Yeah. The one thing that that doesn't work with me as well is I don't know if it's like this where you live, but in Shanghai, some of the restaurants turn over so fast. That by the time I go back, oh, to yeah. time, they're gone. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, but that, that person was really nice, and I wanted to go back. Like restaurants or stores or convenience, like, like anything where you're like the customer walking into something. It's like it turns over so fast. <laughs> mm -hmm. Too but, true. Yeah, the nature of a, a booming economy, I suppose. <laughs> mm -hmm. You mentioned that you were basically a false beginner after that year when you moved to China. What were the things that you felt you needed to kind of review that you didn't remember or have the most experience with that you wanted to when you got here? Well, it's funny because like a lot of people, what you have to know how to say when you come to a country is very different than chapter one in your school textbook, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a little notebook and I still have it and it shows all the words I had to learn right away. Mm -hmm. So the very first one in the book is Bu Yao Xie Xie. Because <laughs> because like I said, Guilin is very touristy. Right. And there was a lot of streets when you would walk down, you, you would get harassed by people wanting to you to buy stuff and they would follow you around. And I'm sure I wasn't helping things by looking like a total greenhorn, <laughs> you know, just just staring at everything like it was the first time. They could tell I just got off the boat. So they were gonna try to cheat me or, or and follow me around and get me to buy stuff so i said how can i and i'm trying to be polite how can i tell them i don't want this to go away right and and my friends told me the best thing to do is just walk away because when you speak to them and especially if you speak to them in chinese that's going to encourage them mm -hmm. they're going <laughs> to think you can speak some chinese and they're really going to go after you and i said no 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 but i want to be polite i want to sit politely to go away you know i don't want it and they taught me but I had this little notebook, some other things. I had to buy water because, you know, there was no clean running water to drink in the apartments. I knew I couldn't drink the water. So I had to learn, you know, I could have just gone and picked up a bottle and paid for it, but I wanted to learn how to speak. So I said, you know, I would like to buy some water or how many bottles of water. And also I was a vegetarian. I had been since high school. So I had to learn how to tell them to not put meat in my dishes. Mm -hmm. So my little notebook is full of these things. Hey expats and geopaths, what do you do with the annoying paper mail that you get to your old addresses in your home country? For a few years, I'd have all of my mail forwarded to one friend and then I'd feel guilty for bothering them so much. So then I'd have a family member deal with my mail and so on and so forth. And I did this for about like, what, 12, 13 years. And it got annoying, and let's face it, I miss some mail because people have better things to do 
then look after my paper correspondence. So I finally broke down and got a service from traveling mailboxes. They will literally receive your mail. You get a U.S. address. You get to pick the city that it's in and you receive mail and they'll let you know when mail comes in. They'll open it, scan it for you so you can read it. If you really need to, they'll forward it to you for a fee. You can also get packages delivered as well. And so there's like a variety of different services that you can have where you don't have to keep bugging your friends and family to deal with your paper mail. So if you go to stephfuccio.weebly.com, it's S-T-E-P-H-F-U-C-C-I-O dot Weebly, W E E. Bly.com. If you go to the bottom, you'll see the blue ad on the right, Traveling Mailbox. Click on that. I am now an affiliate program with them, so if you join their services, we both end up very, very happy campers, and you never have to ask your friends or family to receive your mail again. It's truly a beautiful thing. I do encounter a lot of vegetarians in China that struggle with even when they get the language component right, folks still having like a meat sauce or having like fish <laughs> sauce or some sort of component that's in there. And they're like, but there isn't any meat. How, did you oh, face any of those challenges when you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. How did you get that's around been that? Going... <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't. Well, it still happens uh, occasionally. They, it, it is funny how culturally they don't regard the little pieces of meat as meat. So you'll encounter that from some time to time. I guess they must have regarded it as a flavor or a garnish uh, some, in some way. But um, the way the way I get around it, the way we got around it from the beginning, you know, because I had a few vegetarian friends and stuff, they, they would teach me to say something like, Yi dian ro, ye bu yao. So even even a little bit, even a little bit, I oh, don't want. Oh, and, that's and clever, yeah. That, yeah, that seemed to help. Right. But, um, yeah, because it's annoying if, if somebody doesn't want to eat the dish then just because it has those little bits in it. But, you know, what happened is I got more familiar with what the dish is and what the dish will look like and what ingredients will be in there. As, as I spent more years in China, I know what's safe to order and I can avoid that. But if you're new to China or new to the restaurant, you might not know what to expect just from the name or even the picture. But I, that happens to me very rarely now. Right, right. Do you know any place that folks can look online to see like a list of common dishes that would be just naturally vegetarian? Uh, not off the top of my head, but I do have a couple links and documents that have a list of ingredients and their names oh. for vegans and vegetarians. Okay. If I can get that from you later, because I know I, there are some listeners who are vegetarian and there's someone... Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to save that and try to forward it to you. Yeah, that'd be... I'll make a little note here. That'd be awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you. The language from the classroom to the real life context was different. Dialect wise, did you run into any challenges with standard versus the dialect of where you were? I certainly did. In Guilin, in Guangxi province in the south, they don't use the R sound. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the words are a lot smoother and kind of blend together a little bit. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example for, for like, uh, for four and 10, they say si. Mm -hmm. So I got confused a lot between four and ten, and I and and forty and fourteen, and I know that happens elsewhere in China uh, too. And also the locals there in Guilin, they would flip the F and the H. So a common question is for me as a young man, they would always ask me if I was married yet. So they would say, "Ni jie fun la mei you know, Mary is jie hun. So instead of saying ni jie hun la meo mm -hmm. or ni jie hun la ma, they would say ni jie fun la ma. So they said it with an F sound. That was the local Guilin. They call it, you know, Guilin Hua wow. is, is, is the local language there. So, um, but I was focusing on learning Mandarin, but I think coming there first, right. my ear kind of set its default on Guilin Hua. Right. You know, the Guilin style of pronouncing Mandarin, or, or not really pronouncing Mandarin, but Guilin Hua, basically, is what my 
ear got settled on, but I moved around a lot. So I developed a philosophy that I should be open to any language that I'm hearing and try to learn from it. And my students used to make fun of me because they would say, just study Mandarin, just study Putonghua. It's so silly for you to study the local languages. They, they thought that was funny and ridiculous and a waste of time and something only the older people speak. But I, but I became better at hearing the locals than my students or even my Chinese girlfriend in some places. Right, right, because you were open to those variations. You probably found the... I'm open to it. My mind's open, my ears open, so I can learn it. Yeah. But they don't want to learn it, so they don't, because they've chosen, they've decided they don't want to. Right, 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 right. And this happens in a lot of languages. There's a lot of cultural... Uh, I don't want to say cultural tribalism, but there's definitely like, there can be like an us them with, oh, they talk funny because they don't say it like me kind of thing. Exactly. Yes. There's a stigma, a social stigma. Whereas I think we have less of that when we come into the language and we're like, oh, that's interesting. Like I've noticed, I live very close to Panyulu in Shanghai. And so I noticed like I'm on a major street and near Panyu, and I thought, oh, this is going to be so easy to get back to my new apartment. I'll just say this intersection, and these are two major streets. About every other taxi driver will confuse the, the plosive in Panyu with an F, not with an F. Now I'm going to mess it up with Panyu. Yeah, they do, with an F sound, which is not P. It's not really a normal mistake to make. And so I'm sitting there going, okay, it happened once, it happened twice. The third time, I'm going to start in my really, really broken Chinese, start asking the taxi drivers, hey, where are you from? Because I want to know what regional dialect this is that they're all coming in with. Because this is just not normally, like I've, I've talked to other people about Panyu Lu, and that's not coming up as, as an F sound. So I'm like, what is happening here? <laughs> Whereas I think somebody who was like, this is the way it said, would just be like, well, they're doing it wrong. But it's so interesting to hear those differences. Yes, I've heard that some, I don't know if this is true, so don't quote me on this, but I've heard that when you're young, sometimes, you know, your ear can get set around certain sounds. And if you hadn't heard other sounds, then when you get older, it's really hard to hear them. Because I, I've run into some students and friends in China who can't distinguish the different sounds that I'm saying. Yeah. Whether it be English or Chinese, they just can't even hear it, which I think is fascinating. And I'm sure it happens in the reverse with me. That's why if you can't hear a sound that your Mandarin teacher is teaching you, like when you're first starting out, if you can't hear the difference, it's going to be very hard for you to make that sound. Some people have trouble hearing the differences in tones. Like when you say, si, 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 you know, some people say, what's the difference? If you can't, if your ear can't be open to it yet, you're going to have real, real trouble speaking that language. Mm -hmm. So true. So true. And I think that I've heard that also for languages that have clicks and things, like there's a certain age where after that, if you try to learn it, you're, oh, a lot of people gosh. aren't, aren't able to make those sounds because they're not just their, their minds and, and their sound Gets, or their sound ability gets yeah. stuck, but their physical mechanism, the, their mouths and tongues and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. That is so fascinating Right? To me. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Right? <laughs> it really, really is. But I want to go back to the FH thing that you mentioned in Guilin because that I really, historically, I'm kind of curious about that because when I lived in Japan, they, for every 90% of Fs, they would pronounce with an H sound. Like I lived in Fuchu, F-U-C-H-U, and everybody pronounced it Huchu. And even Mount Fuji was for the local, not even for locals, for Japanese people, Mount Fuji. Like every F was an H. And I'm very curious if there's some overlap historically on why that happens. That is an interesting question. Right? I don't know, but yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's very, very interesting. Because it was across the board. Like some of my students... Like, my last name starts with an F, and they would start to pronounce it like that. And I'm like, okay, okay, but this is Italian, so they actually do say it like this kind of thing. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> but it was really interesting to see that F sound, because they're still writing it like an F, not like an H, even in the romanization, but it's not pronounced like that. So it was, yeah, very interesting stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know enough Japanese to go into the historical context of why they do that, but there it is. <laughs> Like in your usage of of Chinese now, do you find yourself speaking it a lot, uh, writing it a lot? 
I know you make the the cards, and so I imagine there's quite a bit of of writing and and drawing of the the words. But what do you find that you use the most in the language? As as definitely uh, listening and speaking, yeah, by far. Mm-hmm. I don't. I haven't worried about writing for a long time unless it's just for fun and recreation. Because I usually type the pinyin on my phone or computer. Yeah. So I don't bother with learning how to write unless I want to enjoy, you know, the a kind of callig- the calligraphy of it. Right. You know, I'm some from time to time I might do that a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I think my my favorite way is to go to the local tea shop and have tea and talk. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true for a lot of language learners. I mean, from the time we're children, we we hear it first mm-hmm. and then we learn to speak it out as babies. And then we start learning to read, and then we start learning to write. So it kind of goes in that order. I I really don't have to write anything down in my daily life. And if I need to, I can type it out on the phone and show somebody. And I know Chinese are having trouble, too, with forgetting how to write their own characters. Because people are using technology so much now to type out the characters. Um, but I mostly I mostly speak and have conversations, and that's the way I like, so I just run with that. Sure. And I really wonder, that debate is very interesting to me in English and in Chinese, of, you know, we're not able to spell anymore in English, or people can't write the, the characters in Chinese. And I really wonder, that stuff was meant to be a representation of the language anyway, so if we can do it with technology, do we need to have it perfect in handwritten uh-huh. form? I don't know. I'm not fully on either side. I'm just kind of curious if how much it really matters. I don't know. I don't know. Well, that's the question they have to wrestle with. And I, I know they made a TV game show where they have people, Chinese people come on and they tell them a character and see if they can write no it. It's a competition. Way. Do they yeah. really? Oh, my God. I would actually really like to watch that. Do you know what it's called? Is this, is this still on now? I don't know. I remember, I can't remember if I read or heard about that. It oh, might have been a couple of years ago. My don't God. know if it's still on, but they're trying to encourage yeah. young people not to rem- not to forget how to write their language. Right, 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 right. Oh my gosh. I would, uh, I, I will, I'll, I'll look that up too. That, that sounds like something I would geekily like to watch. Not to make fun of them, but just, I love, like I often accidentally say, draw the characters. I'm, I am a terrible artist in the sense that my thing, the things in my head don't look like the things that come out of my hand, but I really, really enjoy the kind of swooshiness of the characters, and I really like drawing them. I often say accidentally draw instead of write them because it feels like calligraphy even when it's with a pencil. So it'd be fun to watch how other people are drawing them, correctly or incorrectly. I think that'd be kind of fun. Anyway, so I was like, oh my god, that's cool, so cool. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay, I think we skipped a bunch of stuff. Shoot, let's go back. So you studied for a year, the language for a year in in a university, and then you came to China. And did you take classes once you were here, or were you just studying by like talking to people and picking up books, or how did you continue studying then? Well, uh, I, I chatted with my friends a lot who were ahead of me, American friends, and I always felt when I went out with them, the way they spoke Chinese, it gave me a lot of encouragement and showed me that I could do it too. And I used to mimic their phrases and they were able to, you know, teach me at the dinner tables when we were out. So that was very helpful. But I, I also got tutored for, I, I want to say about, uh, I think I bought a package for 50 or 60 classes and they were about an hour each. Wow. And this is an in-person tutoring session. Yeah, it was one-on-one, I think. And so that lasted for just a few months because I think I went once a day. So it was it was probably no more than two months. Yeah. And I was kind of off and running after that. I really didn't want to take a class about it because, um, you know, I was a teacher and I was teaching a lot and I didn't want to go back in the classroom. Right. Even for my own learning as a student. And I still don't. So I used to learn just by going out to dinners with friends and talking to local people. Sure. How much do you remember from those tutoring sessions? Like, were you guys working through a book, or were you just bringing in things that happened in life, or what? What kind? Of- well, it was kind of funny because I was a teacher at that point, and I knew a lot about teaching, and so it was. It's kind of weird having to assume the role of a student in a one-on-one scenario, because I used to have my conceptions about 
what how we should approach it. Right. So I kind of had to put that aside. But what I would do was I had a lovely teacher. I still remember her. I haven't I haven't chatted with her in a while, but I should. Her name was uh, Mo Pei Jun, and she works in Guilin, and I know where she works, and I, I guess she's still there. And I used to bring I used to bring what I wanted to study. Basically, mm-hmm. that's the way I did it from the beginning. And that's the way I still recommend. It's not a purist approach by any means. I recommend people study what they think is interesting. So I used to bring whatever books I thought was interesting, or songs, or music. I even wrote some. Chinese songs and poems with her,、mm-hmm. so、oh, that's、wow. what we would do. We do a little bit of textbook work, but after that, we would just go off the trail and into the woods. That's fantastic. So it was the the content was always interesting because you were picking things that you were interested in, right? She and you know she encouraged me to do that, and I think she had more fun with it that way too. Right, right. Oh, that's fantastic. Are you still studying now, or are you just kind of picking up little bits here and there as you、uh, run into it? I always tell people first. I have not studied diligently for years. I, I tell them I'm playing with Chinese. Sure, sure. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I imagine、yeah. it gets to a point where you do that, right? I mean, like you have to consciously study at the beginning, especially because of the, of the huge difference between English and Chinese. But then after a point, I mean, that sounds like the natural progression is you just start doing what you want with it, and then learn what you need to as you go, right? That's putting my way in a very positive light. I like that. <laughs> <laughs>、hmm. Yeah, I can see it both ways because I—I I mean, I guess it really depends on what you want and what's your motivations and what's your goals. Sure. I know for the, for some of my friends who plan to use Chinese in a career, let's say for an example, or people who know and plan to be tested in it and put the certifications on their resumes. Those friends of mine, they have to diligently study certain things day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year to succeed in their endeavor. Sure. So for me, I'm not worried about using Chinese in my job or for a test. So I just study what I like when I like. Right. Right. You know, with who I like. So I I study just off and on. I study what I want. I study poetry. I study philosophy. I like I said I go to the tea the tea shop and I study and talk about tea topics. So what I know is very piecemeal, very random, and so it frustrates me sometimes when in a conversation I lack the words and the sentences to talk about a very basic concept that I've skipped over. <laughs> right, right. But I think that's true. Like in English, I have the ability to talk about. Certain things more than others. I think most people do. Like you know more, you have more vocabulary in the things you really enjoy doing and and talking about. So I think that's a natural progression of just getting to a high level in the language. Is of course you're going to learn more in the areas that you are interested in. Do you feel that without conscious studying, you're losing a lot of the language you learned, or you think a lot of it's coming up as you're as you're reading and doing and speaking with it? Yeah. I, I do think I I do think I lose a lot of what I learn,、uh, but I told myself to just make your peace with that. Yeah,、um, and I think it's because I'm going to be in China a long time, and I hear Chinese a lot every day. That I just I just tell myself, Matt, there's no way you could hold it all. So、right. if you if you encounter a word or a sentence that you really think is so cool, then just write it down or type it down really quickly in your phone or keep a little notebook with you. But besides that, don't worry if you can't remember something that came up; it'll probably come up again. Yeah, you know, and that's that's my philosophy. That that keeps me in the game because I'm the kind of person if I made it a chore or if I beat myself with a stick, then I would give up. Right. So I do. I adopt this philosophy to keep myself in the game. Right. 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 No, I agree with that. It's tricky to keep going and to keep the motivation and to keep the interest, like the yes, the content, interesting important. all at the same time. Yeah, it's like yes, it's like I want to progress, but I want to stay motivated. And if I'm if I, st- it's endurance. It's not a sprint. If you if you want to get it, you got to be in it for years. So you can't you can't you you got to think about your motivation and encouraging yourself. Of course, you're going to forget stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And again, in our first languages, when we don't use some stuff, we'll forget it. Like all the time, we'll be talking to each other and be like, "What is that word? I just ah,、uh, yeah." So I mean that again. That just sounds like that sounds like language. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I go home every year and I tell them part of the reason I'm coming home to be with you guys is to bring my English back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you find yourself functioning more in one language than the other on your in your daily life? Um, like, do you find that the things you read and listen to and, and, and write and those kinds of things are more in Chinese than they are in English? No, I think if I, if I'm totally honest, it's mostly, I'm still kind of living in an English bubble to some extent because a lot of my news and social media is all English. And I can only imagine if I was, if I was soaking up that much Chinese every day, <laughs> mm. where my Chinese would be, I think most of the, what's incoming is English and probably most of what's outgoing is English. Okay. Um, I would have to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's fair. I mean, it is the language that you can that you do the most in. And culturally speaking, there is a difference between news in English and news in Chinese, and there's different viewpoints and different kinds of things. Yeah. Well, there are there are some people out there who, when they come to China, they refuse to speak in English. Oh, and if that works for them, that's great. I right. Just, yeah, it's right. They kind of they kind of uh, put that restriction on themselves. So. You know, for better or worse, in, you know, there's a million ways to Sunday, and some people may decide, I'm only going to watch Chinese TV, I'm only going to watch Chinese cartoons, and they 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 seriously they put some kinds of restrictions on their on what kind of input language input they have so that they can move faster. But for me, you know, it's still a lot of, and I want to improve my English. Actually, that's on my to do list. So. I actually study English as well. <laughs> wow! In in what way do you want to improve? Well, I noticed over the years teaching English in China that my English is getting worse because <laughs> language erosion not... is very real. Yeah. Yeah. What, what did you call it? Language erosion. Oh, I love that term. I'm gonna. I, that I wish I had made it up, but it's actually I don't know where I picked it up, but somewhere oh, along the line of either teaching okay. or studying how to teach, it it came up, and I just went, oh that. That makes complete sense because if you're not using yes. it, especially when you're you're in Asia, a lot of times you're teaching lower level students and you don't really use a lot of your language. And I found myself like watching and reading a lot of stuff that was much denser than I normally would because I just needed that kind of stretch linguistically. And I was just I stopped doing like fun things in English for a while because I was just trying to kind of balance out my language usage. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah no it's it's a thing it's definitely a thing and it happens yeah. in any language not just your first language but it's definitely a thing yeah well i think because i was so fascinated by chinese after a few years i started thinking matt you've lost your fascination with english where did mm -hmm. that go mm -hmm. as a youngster i think i was so much more fascinated and had an imagination for english so i, I wanted to bring that back and keep developing you know, especially as a teacher, as a college too, and sometimes we have to do public lectures and speeches and open classes. And I felt like I still had the English of a twenty-one year old or a twenty year old. And so that's <laughs> crazy. I'm I'm thirty one now, and I've been teaching at the college for many years, and I my English has been stagnant. So I want to work on it. I I totally understand. It's been a struggle to keep, and I think I've lost a lot, especially in what's used now. I think by living overseas, also I've kind of like, I think my language has become very dated to when I, la well, exactly. I've done yes. little stints in the U.S. in graduate <laughs> school, but that language isn't actually commonly used the language either. So it's like, yeah, like the everyday language that people use, I'm so, so dated as far as like when I left the U.S. <laughs> on a long-term basis. Like some of my, when I was teaching at university in the U.S. and I'd say something and my 19-year-old my American students would look at me like, who says that anymore? And I'm like, apparently I do. <laughs> They're like, teacher, that's, that's so like 10 years ago. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. That's about If you're enjoying this conversation about the Chinese language and would like to participate, if you're studying the Chinese language or if you come from the Chinese language and have learned other languages, either perspective is greatly, actually both perspectives are greatly appreciated on this channel. Let's have a conversation. Let's tape that sucker and let's get it into this podcast. Contact me. 
and let's etch out the details on how to get you and your valuable language learning experience onto this podcast. All of my information is in the show notes. Also, all over social media except Facebook, I am Steph Puccio, S-T-E-P-H-F-U-C-C-I-O. That includes Gmail for my email, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, and LinkedIn. So I look forward to hearing from you. Language isn't actually commonly used the language either. <laughs> so it's like the everyday language that people use. I'm so, so dated as far as like when mm-hmm, I left the mm-hmm, U.S. Mm-hmm. on a long-term basis. Like some of yeah. my, when I was teaching at university in the U.S. and I'd say something and my, my 19-year-old American students would look at me like, who says that anymore? And I'm like, <laughs> apparently I do. <laughs> They're like, teacher, that, that's so like 10 years ago. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. That's about the last time I lived in the U.S. <laughs> Exactly. That's the fascinating thing about how language, it erodes and it grows and it changes and it shifts. Yeah. Like on some level, I think, because I really like li- listening to other podcasts and I think, okay, I'm probably going to get some of the current slang in there, but now podcasts have gotten so polished on some level. Mm. Like the level of language in some mm-hmm. podcasts has gone up. So it's not even like I'm getting that everyday slang either. So it's like... <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm capture that that uh that language anymore <laughs> but then again i don't like you i don't really see myself going back to the i don't know if i'll stay in china very long but i don't foresee myself going back to the u.s anytime soon so why do i need to <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's challenging it's challenging yeah i do know a bunch of folks that are doing there's like podcasting is starting to become a thing in china and um, and podcasts in Chinese are starting to become more popular. And my initial goal was reading, because that I can take with me anywhere. I can look at it online. I can. I'm much more comfortable writing than speaking anyway. So I could chat with people online, you know, by typing it in that kind of thing. But once I heard about podcasts taking off in Chinese, I was like, oh no, now I have to add a listening goal because that sounds like a really cool medium to include in my future listening. So yeah, going back to reading. Do you ever find yourself reading the same thing in both languages? Like the same book or the same, I guess? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that's one method I didn't mention is I really like to read children's books in Chinese. I have a collection of probably a hundred children's books, and many of them are books that I read as a child. And some of them are totally in Chinese. Some of them are half uh, like one page is english and it, and the next page is chinese or else it has the english or it may have the chinese under the english so i have a bunch of bilingual books yeah definitely that's so cool how did you start doing that like what gave you the inspiration for that uh well i i might have thought i, I can't remember exactly when that started but i i probably thought to myself you know, as a child, what did you do to learn? You read books a lot with your parents. You know, I told you that story. So I probably knew I at some point needed to get some Chinese children's books. But what happened is actually one day I was in a Chinese, a big Chinese market. And of all things, there was a huge table there that day piled high with children's books out of the blue. This is a place I go to get vegetables. It's like a huge open air vegetable market. I mean, they have some other things, but you know how China is. Sometimes the most random things pop up. And so I had to have that opportunistic mindset. I knew this could not be, this might not be here tomorrow or next week. And um, I think I must have bought like 25 books on the spot because they were only like five quiet a piece or something. Um, so I bought a bunch and I came back every single day until she was gone. And I think I had like a hundred books by the time she would left, you know, I don't know why she didn't stay just to serve me. She probably could have made a fortune, but, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was pulling out books that uh, I was pulling out English children's books that are from like the forties and the fifties. With, with the English erased and the, you know, same pictures, but the English is erased and Chinese is put in its place. So like famous English children's books from England and also the States and some from Canada, ones that my parents read to me. Um, and then more recently, more modern books like uh, The Giving Tree and stuff like this. 
Um, so I stocked up on those, and I, I do read those a lot. That is fantastic. I've had some people fairly recently suggest like watching movies that you know and like having the language in the language, your first language, like for me, having the language in English, like the audio language in English, but having the subtitles in Chinese, especially for me, I'm, I want to read. And I was, I've, that's one of the things that I'm hoping to start doing soon. And I feel like this is one of those things, like you said, something you enjoy doing in your first language, start doing it in the language that you're learning. Did you notice any fun differences between the language or the cultural aspects of the books, even though the pictures were the same and the stories were basically the same? Did you pick up on any differences? N nothing major. Um, some, some, and I won't be able to think of a specific example, but sometimes things, when they do the translation, sometimes they have to put it in a way that the Chinese reader would understand. So you you look at it and you're like, well, that, they didn't translate it right. And it's like, well, but no, part of translation is you have to make it understood. You have to make it understandable. So I, I do notice that a lot. And I pick that up more and more as I learn the way Chinese people think about something uh, and the way Chinese works. But for the most part, the children's books are a little more simple. And you, I don't think you see a major difference. They do... I mean, the translation's pretty darn close. Right, right. Like, I I have tried to pick up, like, Chinese books for children, but I I found that the language was, again, in, even before I was focusing more on reading, I was trying to do, I don't know, it was just a mess. But I, but I found that between the cultural differences, the stories, and the text, it was just, it was too much. But I think coming from a story you know and then doing it that way, and then the language being the only difference. I think that would be a huge yes. bump in understanding. Yes. Yeah, that's a brilliant Absolutely. idea. Oh my goodness. I feel like there's a video series in there somewhere, Matt. I feel like... <laughs> I feel like sure, well, I know some people, they, there's been some popular channels where, pe like, parents... They read the books. They they have a video of them of the book, and you see their hand and the pages turn, and they'll read the books in Chinese and English. Um, so you can play that for your child. So your your child's watching a video, but it's basically showing the turning pages of a book. So I think that's a great idea. I love being read to. I've always been a fan, even though I I, I read a lot. I've also always been a fan of like old school like radio shows and audio you know, audiobooks and podcasts like I, I can't pick between written form and audio form it's almost impossible and I yeah yeah that's a nice bridge isn't it that's a cool idea it's a really cool idea because you're seeing it hearing it and you've got the pictures there too so you're not really sacrificing a ton I mean it's not cuddling up in somebody's lap but as far as as far as I'm concerned I don't, I don't need that right now as an adult so I'm okay <laughs> If they can find a way to put put arms on the computer or some sort of Android, then that can raise your child for you. <laughs> hey, I'm seeing more and more giant stuffed animals in, around stores in Shanghai, so I'm sure those exist in other places too. <laughs> I'm seeing more and more robots too, like baby robots. I don't know what they do yet, but I keep seeing them in tech stores. Yeah, it's coming. It's so coming. Yeah. No, there's so much that people are doing with video now that if you had told me five years ago, I would have been like, oh, why would, why would anybody watch that? But honestly, some of it I find myself watching and really liking. Like the study with me videos, I thought, oh my God, this is going to be so boring to watch. And as I'm watching people study, I'm like, oh, they do that. Oh, maybe I should try that out. And I'm like, this should be the most boring thing in the world to watch. But yet, I'm totally enwrapped with what they're doing with highlighters and their, their, how they're like putting things in their notebooks and different kinds of things. It's just, it's ridiculous. <laughs> well, there was a, a saying that I heard, an encouraging saying that if you are interested in something, you can find other people who are too. So I think these people kind of operate under that philosophy. If I like highlighting this word or turning this book and re recording the reading of a book, there's going to be other people who want this. And they're right. Yeah, I was listening to some podcast some uh, some Slate podcasts and they were talking about they were talking about elevator videos in YouTube. Like it's just people going into different elevators and taking short videos of it. And they were laughing at it. And I thought actually that might be kind of interesting if it was different places around the world. 
Oh, sure, yeah. That might be interesting. And they're totally making fun of it. And I'm going, actually. (laughs) Well, I watched this. Now I'm going to drag this conversation a little bit off topic. But I recently watched a TED Talk where a person, um, they were talking about the danger of YouTube autoplay, how parents let their children watch YouTube, and in three or four videos, the child can be watching something horribly inappropriate. You know, you start with a Disney movie, and then like three audio plays later, you're in a dark realm. And uh, one one thing that he um, talked about was uh, there's an insanely popular style of videos where people just open these toy eggs, I don't know if you've seen this, but it's it's basically they, they just have these eggs with a little toy inside and the person rips off the wrapping, opens it, shows the toy, goes to the next egg. And so there's millions of these videos and they're taking over the world. They're taking over children's mind because children love to see someone open a present. And so the kids get addicted to these little videos. But anyway, you know, Anything can get popular for any variety of reasons, but... And it's almost hard to predict what is the next popular thing, right? Exactly. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Okay, that is one that doesn't sound like one I would watch, but <laughs> but, but there are so <laughs> many that I would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right? Oh, right? If it was, oh my God. You're right. I have no bounds. I will watch anything once. Because um, <laughs> I find myself in China, because they do a lot with glass. And in a lot of uh, hotels and stuff, because I used to travel a lot last year, you'll be going up the elevator with the glass wall and you'll start to see better, better views of the city. And I'm like, that's kind of cool. I would do that. I would make those videos and share them and stuff. So anyway, yeah, we we have we have gone off track. (laughs) But it's it's part of the whole creature. I mean, this this part, to be fair, this podcast is connected to a language vlog where there are videos of ridiculous things that nobody should watch, and yet people are watching it. Yes, listeners, look forward to our next vlog of going upstairs in different countries. <laughs> I, did, I, did, I did one where I was doing graffiti in my stairway of my apartment, because I was like, I don't know what this stuff says yet, but I think it's interesting that this, uh-huh. it's just here. Like, this stairway is just... Yeah, I'm, sh- I'm sure I've showed mine at one point, too little ads stuck in there and whatnot. Yeah, it's just anything in China. In, in Hanzo right now, I will take a picture of anything. Yesterday, I was in a cafe. It was one of this like beautiful, really like clean, kind of modern wood looking, airy cafe with the, the kind of spiral staircase. And I went to the bathroom and there's all this clutter in the bathroom. And in this corner are these two paint like plastic paint containers with a used brush with dried paint on top but there the hands of characters were and i didn't know what it said i can't read painting chinese right so i'm just like oh my god there are these characters i don't know quick take a picture (laughs) that's just yeah anyway it's funny to me because i'm like standing i'm in this bathroom i wasn't multitasking but before I left the bathroom, I crouched down under the sink where the stuff was and took a picture of that because there was language that somebody's using to know how to paint this, that color, this, that color, this paints for this thing, this paints for that thing. Maybe I'd said no pictures. Right? Are you sure? It could have. But it was but it was on the it was on the can itself. So I don't think they would have okay. had oh, no okay. pictures on the can. Thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know the irony. I imagine at some point I am taking a picture of something that says no pictures, but I can't read that yet. Well, no, I, I think I know no, like in sign form, but yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so future language goals, because it sounds like you're just doing things that are organically in the areas that you want to keep using the language. So is that... Oh yeah, I'm 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 all about goal setting. My I definitely want to keep improving my Mandarin, and I want to get over to the tea shop more and have more conversations. And I am now I I have a goal to learn the basics of Cantonese because I live in Guangdong Province. I live in the homeland of Cantonese food and culture and language. And when I arrived here about a year ago, I realized wow I. I'm not in Kansas anymore. The, I had learned Mandarin for maybe six years, and now everybody around me is speaking Cantonese. And they, they use Mandarin for transactions and for school and stuff and for meetings, maybe. 
But besides that, their mother tongue is Cantonese, and all my students, a lot of them, their their first language is Cantonese. So I thought this is an opportunity, and it's fun. So yeah, the basics of Cantonese would be a goal of mine. As of right now, differences between Cantonese and Mandarin. What striking you is the biggest? Oh so, yeah, I'm not I'm not worried too much about the writing. I was at first, but then I thought, Matt, you never write. It's silly to force yourself to be a good writer when you don't when you're not going to use it. That's just trying to keep up with the Joneses, with people who have different goals from you. You're, you're not going to be writing in Chinese. You don't even want to. You're not interested in that. So don't force yourself to do that. But the, that said, the char- some of the characters are the same. Some of them are written differently. Some of them are pronounced similarly or the same. Some are pronounced differently. The, what I really like and what gives me a leg up is the sentence structures are the same as far as I can tell. So I just need to learn how to pronounce the words differently but how you set up your sentences and basically have your conversation is very similar, uh, again, as far as I can tell as a beginner. So there's basically six tones. Some people will say there's nine, but I think in the, in the, in the recently revised system that I use, the Yutping system, they say there's really only six tones. But, but again, same approach to Mandarin, I'm not gonna worry too, too much about the tones. You know, and I, I've gone out and I've spoken a little Cantonese and I can make myself understood. So I'm not going to let that hold me back, just the same as Mandarin. It seems a little bit more sing-songy, a little bit more cut up than Mandarin. And when I spoke some to my parents, they said, you know, that sounds like Vietnamese to me. And I did a little research and I realized there's millions of Cantonese speakers in Vietnam. I did not know that. Okay, I lived in so, Vietnam and I didn't know that. Really? Yeah, yeah. Whoa. So it's part of the, I guess, the Pearl River Delta Cantonese language culture that has has moved and spread out of South China, I guess, going into Vietnam. And I don't know how similar Vietnamese sounds to Cantonese, but my parents thought, are you speaking Vietnamese? So no, it's Cantonese. So it sounds a little bit more choppy, I would say, than Mandarin. But I, I like it. It's a lot of fun. Oh, that's awesome. That's really cool. All right. Yeah, no, I hadn't ever thought of that, but, about that, but that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And Vietnamese is choppier, and in Min Min in Pudong Hua, it, it, there are more, like, sh sounds than there are in Vietnamese. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Cool. Okay. Really, really cool. Oh, well, if we're, if we're you know, emphasizing language learning, that's that is my, um, that's one of my jobs, is making language learning card games. I have a company called Language Card Games, languagecardgames.com. And I did that because that is one way that I like to learn and play. And I couldn't find language learning games that would satisfy me. Um, th there's a lot of great cards and flashcards out there, I think, for beginners and beginners of language learning, beginners of a language, and also for children. But I couldn't find something more complex, more intriguing, more for intermediate level gamers and language learners. So I just set about, started making some games. And I've, I've made a, a game for Mandarin Chinese. It's called Chinese Champions. And I've made two, I've made two, uh, Chinese Champions. So there's Chinese Champions 1 and Chinese Champions 2. And uh, it's an intermediate level game. It's quite challenging and difficult to play. I mean, if you're a gamer, you might not think it's that bad. And I'm, I'm really proud of the second one. I actually think Chinese Champions 2, if, if, if your listeners or you have a chance, I think you should check it out. I'm, I really feel like Chinese Champions 2 was, has been my masterpiece so far of all my games because it has photography from my travels around China. So yeah, it's the, the, pho the photography is from is all my own photography through uh, my travels in different provinces. So it's, it's kind of chronicles my journey and also the words too. And I've included some stories that I wrote in Chinese with the game. So it's Chinese stories, you know, it, it goes deep and I'm really proud of it. So if, if any um, gamers are listening, 
definitely check out Chinese Champions. That's awesome. And they are beautiful, beautiful creatures. I, I told you this previously. I'm not a gamer, but when I when I got the one the set that you sent me and I opened it, I was like, oh my god! Like the quality of the cards and the the like how beautiful and how structurally strong they are and how many. I like the different pieces of the game and the, just the case. I mean, it, you could tell how much time and effort you put into it, and then it was a labor of love. It was just phenomenal. Thank you, Thank you so much. You know, I I made a big mistake because I I meant the the moment we got on the phone, I meant to say thank you so much for doing that review. I wanted to thank you in person, but we had some we had some connection difficulties right off the bat, and I forgot. But I showed your video to my family and some of my friends, and everybody loved it, and they loved you, and they loved your bubbly presentation of it, and we just all thought it was so great. So, really, thank you so no, much. No, all of that came out of a, out of a genuine respect to what you had created, and it, it's funny because I don't know um, if you lis listened or watched the interviews I did with Phil, who's from England, who learned Chinese in China, actually outside and then in China. And he actually just, he was in Shanghai for a year on an internship and he just moved back to Nanjing. And um, before he left, I still had the card game you sent me. And I was like, this is like the most perfect thing ever. Because he's a massive gamer and he's very much into oh, science okay. fiction. Yeah, he's reading science fiction in Chinese. Oh, like that's how, how okay. deep into the language he's gotten. And so when he was about to leave, I was like, wait a minute, this is perfect. It's useless for me that's and awesome. it needs to live in the world. And, and he was talking about all this stuff. I gave it to him through my husband because he saw him bef just before he left. And apparently he was super pleased. And I, I haven't checked in yet because he moved and you know things are kind of a mess at first, but I'm definitely going to check in and see what he's done with it, see if I can coerce him to like do a video for you and that kind of thing. Cause That's awesome. Yeah, but yeah, I just That's wanted to let you know. Awesome. It's made it into into hands that will use it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. So awesome. Okay, so thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing this. You're welcome. Thank you for having me and keep on doing what you're doing. I wish you continuing success with your channel. I will stay tuned for sure. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Changing Scripts podcast. Again, if you are learning the Chinese language or if you're coming from the Chinese language learning another language, I'd love to interview you for this podcast. Please feel free to contact me in any social media way that you see fit. Go ahead and contact me and we will hash out how to get you on this sound creation known as the Changing Scripts podcast. A lot more is coming your way soon.